welcome everybody. Um, this session it is about the being of the territory. And um, I am Albert. I collaborate with Ecoversities and also with the with the Garden of Friendship of the Binational Park between Mexico and the US. I work in the border. And in this session, I invited two friends of mine. One of them is Juan Jose Lugo. He's a permaculturist in Ecuador. And he connects with the trees and he really has a great sense of, of the spirit of the place. And another friend that I met this year is Kela, Kela Young. He has an ecoversity, which whose name is Living Trace. Uh, and he is a really interesting fellow. Um, and originally the plan was to invite this person, Marco Pogashnik. He connects with stones, with the territory. He gave us a video for the conference, which you can see on our YouTube channel. And two days ago, there came a conversation on the Reconnect Fiesta about what is, what is the territory? What is the importance of the territory? What's the weight of this territory in our lives? So I wanted to bring that intention into this session. And first, I wanted to, I wanted to open breakout rooms to, to talk between ourselves about what are we, um, I don't remember the question, Juanjo. Can you remember? Can you help me a little bit? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So this invitation is to talk with each other a little bit about a story, perhaps a remembrance that we have on the connection that we had with a territory display space or even a small place that we live through or we pass we were passing through that move us that taught us something deeply in our lives that we have a strong connection with the place that we lived for a brief period of time and how that connection was made perhaps um some of you have that deep connection with some places and we like to start this kind of exchange um, giving each other the space to talk about the relationship that each of you had with some place, territory, um, a landscape uh, in your life. Just a small example, uh, we have, I think uh, it's 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to talk to each other and to, um, and to, to share a little bit of what was this experience. Uh, I don't know if the, the, the question is clear. I don't know if it, it needs to be clarified. So this question about the being of the territory, uh, it, it, it starts for me from, from being on university and having to study geology. And one thing that you do in geology is read the landscape. We often connect earth science with geopoetry in the sense that every landscape has a coherence, has a rhyme to it. Stones rhyme with each other. There is a resonance in the geologic processes. And there was a class that was really impactful to me. That class was ge geodiversity. Um, we usually think only in terms of biodiversity, but there, there is also a rich, richness of stones, of fossils, of, of landforms, especially in my territory, which is Baja California. And Baja California 
it is in Mexico and it is it is almost as if it came out from the Little Prince book where the pilot gets trapped in the Sahara. And there is a, con a conversation between the sky, the desert, the desert and the ocean. So the elements are always in this constant weathering. Um, and also decisions. Um, I, I dedicated a lot of my time studying seashells from the Gulf of California. And they are always pointing towards the direction of the currents. And it was to, through geodiversity that I came to your mythology. And afterwards, it was just a matter of time until coming into other ways of being on the world, of feeling the world, of sensing the world. And I came to the work of permaculture because David Hungry also has also has this. He also shared that permaculture was a collection of indigenous knowledges and very experiential techniques. And I'm not a permaculturist, but moving through my landscape in my city. Um, I realized that the mountains, even if there is the concrete, you can really feel the mood of the land. And now working with the, I work on uh, on the Friendship Garden of the B National Park. It is between the border between the U.S. and Mexico, between San Diego and Tijuana. And I work really on the edge of the fence that divides the two countries. And the thing is that we receive a lot of visits from snakes, from rattlesnakes that they move through the fences. And what we are trying to do in this, it is really an ecoversity. It is that we want to make a sanctuary for native species and also exotic species. And it can be a unit of regeneration across the two nations, which and both of them, they are nation states. Um, they they are called, you know, we are in the Kumiai territory. And we have tons of sacred mountains around here. Um, some of them, they overlap this, this border, this, um, this iron wall. So I feel that a lot of our work in filling the territory is going beyond that wall that divides the intention, the agency of the place to bring more aliveness into what we humans try to separate between the weather and and the machines and structures that we build over this weather, because the earth also has a weather. The earth is always moving in tectonic um, impulses and forces. Um, I will pass it to Keala if you can share with me a little, with us a little bit about um, his journey with feeling the territory. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Yeah, and um, I think part of my invitation to be here um, was born from our conversation about um, Marco Pogacnik's um, work, which I was exposed to uh, at uh, in Scotland, um, which which is a place of origin for some of my uh, ancestors that I hadn't been back to. Um, so um, being there was really powerful. Um, and then also studying uh, the work around sensitivity to energies um, and the flows of energy. And in that sense, the shape of the land um, and the ways that the air moves on the land. Um, and I, essentially a bit of an elemental uh, way of sensing place. 
so feeling the 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 wind the movement of the wind um, and the air and feeling the the uh the quality of the earth of different you know of stone uh, and soil and sand you know just the varieties of the ways that elements are moving and of course the way that water moves on the land and shapes the land over time and so being in the places where the water is flowing and has been flowing um, continuously for for so long just sensing and feeling the wisdom of the flowing waters um, this have been really important um, informing aspects for me as a I, I also have a background in permaculture and uh, regenerative design and that sort of an approach and my orientation with that is a lot from that place of deep listening and humility and uh, the there's a we live in a kind of a, in the globalized era you know which has many uh, a legacy of a lot of pain because of the patterns of colonialism and yet there are also these um, gifts of connectivity so learning about the song lines and the way of the song lines in the the of the Australian Aboriginal people um, that has really touched me and resonated for me. Um, so this is um, these are just some of the threads I think that I would be weaving in here is the aspect of song lines and the way that the the land is singing um, and telling stories to us and that we are carrying the stories also with the land. Um, and then the last piece I'll share. A, but that's also part of how I met Albert and how I'm part of the movement with ecoversities is that our ecoversity here is called Living Trace. Um, and the Living Trace is the, um, it has many ways of interpretation, um, but it includes the ways that we can have a living uh, impact in the world, a positive living impact in our, you know, by relating in that way and learning um, in the context of how our, um, how our existence, how our embodiment is impacting the world around us and how we can have a living, uh, a living impact um, and beyond our, um, yeah, beyond, beyond our form. So being in the energy and, and contributing to the energies. I think that's enough for a little, little taste of where I'm, where I'm coming from. Uh, Albert, shall we pass it next? Oh, you are muted, but yeah. Um, pass it to Juanjo. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Kiala. Uh, so I'm going to try to share something really, really short so we can start like exchanging a little bit. Um, so how do I came to this path of like integrating the essence, the being of the earth, the being of the land, the place, the territory into a dialogue so we can share the path together so we can realize that we are sharing a path together and we can put that into our lives into into the design of the place and so on i started studying uh, i studied i finished it and uh, agriculture engineering but i was not really happy with that <laughs> i i was born in in, a, in the capital city of ecuador and one interesting thing that i just recently uh, um, relate to is the place that I lived, which is a multifamiliar place in the in the middle of Quito, it used to be an ancient temple, long, long, long time ago, dedicated to the moon. So I grew up with these huge stones playing when I was a little kid, and I was really I I didn't knew that they were a part of a big temple uh, where I was living with and playing around and so on. Just recently I found out that and I asked my, my parents like, did you know that this was an old temple when you bought this? And they told me, we we saw when they were building the, the structures, we saw the big, the big stones, but we never asked. It was like, I don't know what was that. And then it was like, for them it was nothing really important. And this small story is part of how we relate to the territory and how we are kind of destined to be part of the territory. And in my path, curiosity has been something that really pushes me into searching something more, trying to find my own path, not following somebody else's path. 
and this and this trying to figure out what was that I really wanted. I found permaculture. I study permaculture, and I try to move from permaculture to something more. And I started to transition myself and to put permaculture, this transition concept and idea into myself. And into this path, I found out about Radistisha. And I was a lot being really, really skeptic about that. Completely, completely skeptic. Like I, uh, in my engineer kind of mind, I was not really believing that. But it came from a good friend of mine, and I started to explore it. And uh, the, the historic center of, of Quito used to be a huge temple. And for me, it was kind of like how it was when I was a young kid. But in this time, I was playing with the, with the ones and reading the territory, reading what was through the center historic, the historical center of Quito. And from that, I started to find patterns and realize that there are layers. And this is just, I'm gonna explain it as simple as I can so, uh, so we can move on. So, but I found that there are the mineral layer, let's say, which is the shape. Albert was telling us a little bit about the mineralogy, the geology, the topographic movement, how the shaping of the earth is part and it's kind of like the physical part of Gaia, of the earth, of the place. And if we pay attention to it, we see the bumps, we see the hills, we see the creases, and then we start to relate it as a huge part of it. And then I realized that there's also subtle bodies of the earth, which provides the forces of life that comes from the deepest part of the earth. And that forces go through the mineral process of the earth and breaks and manifests in certain points. And the ancient temples are aligned basically into these points of life that brings into, that emanates from the earth, the deepest part of the earth. And I saw that they were designing everything through this for them they were for the ancient ones for them that they look at it for them was evident it was on simple sight they can see it they can relate to it and we somehow on the path we lost that and the last body that i i, I want to share a little bit and is the body of let's say the emotions of the earth yes and it's related with the mineral part, with the, the, the hills also, and the forces of life. And in manifest, it's kind of like a, let's call it an atmosphere. An atmosphere that we go, we, we, we go through, uh, that atmosphere is the word? Correct me if, yes, cool. An atmosphere, yeah, that would be the precision. An atmosphere that you go and you feel through. And that atmosphere is related where with the people that lives there and related with the, the work that we do into these places. So all of this is just a simple brief thing that I started to, to learn, trying to understand the patterns, visualizing these, these ideas, these concepts, and then put it into a design process and helping people and projects to put that design and to give voice to the territory, to the landscape, to the to the, to this um, non-human part of life that can also talk and have dreams and wants to express and wants to co-design with us. So yeah, I think that's more or less what I wanted to share. And how did I come to this part? I don't know, Albert, if. Um. Uh, thank you, uh, Juanjo. It just reminded me, uh, in this Western uh, frame of mind, and uh, the land is wild, in the sense that it has not been. It's empty land, you know, and in some indigenous cosmovisions. Recently, I was in Canada. And I was reading a master thesis 
on on the na on the na ke on the na way of living uh, of the na country. Um, it, it is an indigenous tribe in in the Yukon, and um, for them there is no concept of wilderness, but every everything on the land has roots. Land for them means a place with where feet have been over, over it. And when moving through the forest, as uh, you can almost feel the presence of other animals, of the moose, of the elk, of the bears. So it's like these lines that you were mentioning, Juanjo, that uh, life comes in many forms. And sometimes it's just traces, like the ecoversity of Keala. And we wanted to make, open this space. Um, if any of you uh, on the audience, if you have stories of the territory that maybe that you that you are carrying with you, or that you heard on the breakout rooms, something that you wanted to share about the territory, about that being its voice. Um. It's freestyle, so don't feel shy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to um, jump in. I really thank you. Thanks for sharing from your heart. And I appreciate being able to have conversations that invite us to think about what the deeper cosmos or psychology or thinking about our different relatives and humans are. We don't often get to do that. Um, a lot of times when people introduce it, it's also still about biomimicry or anthropology. And it's like, what about these things in the land itself? Farming in the United States, when it's really busy and hard, people only want to focus on what's happening with humans. And it's like, ah, but the land is deep in what it's doing and I have to work with it. And in the United States, it's also been really interesting where people start talking about regenerative agriculture and these movements that we know we have to go to and that many have practiced that. They also forget the humans, which are mostly black and brown, undocumented and migrant people, and only focus on the relationships of what it means around land and fossil fuels and things like that. And so I was just reflecting on both and I appreciated the dive into genuinely talking about what it means to have different conceptions of different living relatives. I would just like to receive that and, uh, you know, in honor of being one of the people invited to share and really acknowledging um, yeah, the privilege of where I am. And um, one of the other complexities of the times that we're in is that seasonally this air behind me um, is sometimes filled with um, wildfire smoke to the degree that it's not breathable. Um, and that's one of the signs of the times, uh, the ways that things are changing. Um, in some of the air quality here. Um, so I, I want to share that piece that um, that in the spirit of living trace, the, the, the point is that we are the stewards of life and we are life itself. And it, life is, is a miracle that it continues. And it should not be taken as an assumption that the miracle of life will continue without us being good stewards of life um, in, in that way. And um, it is the same that some soil will not be able to support life. Um, it might be toxic and, you know, and this, this sort of thing. So just kind of really holding that piece that, um, that it's absolutely true that it's a miracle that we are here in any position to help steward, uh, steward life and keep life going. And that's the spirit of living trace ecoversity to help uh, people um, be empowered and have space and have sanctuary to be able to uh, embody and, and carry on and, keep life going. Thank you. Yeah, 
I, I would like to share that um, something that um, was quite meaningful for me to remember today after the first uh, question that you raised for the breakout room um, and has to do a lot with what Yeyo was saying is that I realized that when I have connected to a territory or to a land or to a place, it, it was because I was somehow clean in a way that I'm currently uh, living in a city. I don't experience. And what I mean by that is that I, I experienced recent living in a, in a place, in an island where electricity was forbidden and they were taking care of the health of the sky. And also they forbid kind of this electromagnetic communication in the sea uh, when they, when they are, because they used to have a, a lot of uh, naval um, uh, transit. So when I was in this island, also because of the volcanic land, that it's kind of a shelter to electromagnetic pollution, I started, my body started sleeping well, eating differently. Um, and I realized that I don't really know what living in a city, how that is stressing my being and my body. But when I am in that place, that they're forbidding electricity, that they're uh, forbidding different types of electromagnetic pollution, my being started reacting differently. So I felt very connected to the land. So I, uh, I, I just felt like in the opening question that, and I wonder how Juanjo, how, how have you experienced that when you, when you connect, I, I believe there are people who are just like, uh, perhaps more, um, skilled or they have like certain types of gift that they can understand the land. And in a way, I think we all can do it, but we need to clean ourselves, not only in paradigms, but also other things that we are, that is just energy. That sometimes we, if we clean up that, we are, we may be more open to, to understand and to be what we are, that is part of the everything, right? So this is something that I just wanted to share with you because I didn't make it conscious until you ask um, at the beginning of this, of this uh, meeting. Uh, I can share. I can share from from my little bit of experience. There's there's a, there's a little story that I I that I that I want to share. Uh, I study anthroposophy, and and uh, the the main character of anthroposophy is Rod Steiner. And somebody asked Rod Steiner uh, a, a question. that was like, why can we achieve the develop the spiritual development of great initiates uh, at these moments and these times because why is it so difficult for us to achieve these levels of initiation and the answer that Steiner said was electricity and that's all that he said and what you are saying um uh, Bane, Remember what I told you at, at the beginning that there's this atmosphere that is on top of what we go through the land, the earth. This atmosphere is being um, uh, interfered with even our thoughts and our projections. Our even our own imaginations change the atmosphere of the path that we took of the land that we live on. It is such subtle changes that we project in ourselves, but there's also relationship with energy, uh, intercommunication, and the waves that are going through the air and interfering with this natural atmosphere that we are related in the land. So, um I think one of the one of the things is like and one of the things that I will want to to share is how are we relating ourselves, how are our own atmosphere relating 
to the atmosphere that on the land, on the places that we are uh, passing through or living in. We are able to change our own atmospheres, but that requires a lot of work and it's going to be harder and harder as long as the technology that we are developing and using every day is um, uh, on a path of uh, materialism and not trying to integrate uh, the whole uh, construction that we uh, are in, like the spiritual level, the subtle levels, and also the material level. So if we go and check the 5G, 4G, and so on, those are the energy that goes through the air that has a lot of um, a lot of energy per se, not as a simple question, but like it comes, it has a lot of um, energy in itself. You can measure the energy that goes on the radios, on the antennas that are going through this atmosphere and interfering with that relationship that we are going and developing in the implant. So how can we uh, clean ourselves? How can we achieve that? That it's something that we can explore uh, on a, another talk perhaps, but there are some people that relate with um, certain, certain practices that allows them to be clean. Um, I One of the things that I do is the relationship with um, my own self and the relationship with those who are living on the land and how I connect with them and how I came into this small community that wants to do something positive and create and steward land as Kiara was saying. And I'm gonna like open the this question, how we can improve this atmosphere. Uh, perhaps some of you have some knowledge of that and wants to share. Kiala, Albert, I don't know. Um, so I open that for for all of us. For me, I think it is really important. I had this discussion with Kiala that we also need to take care about the, the material that, or the, the diet that we have with our imagination, you know, as what we imagine is what we create. And sometimes if we consume a lot of things that make us anxious, that that can also reflect on the atmosphere that you were sharing, Juanjo. It creates sort of um, a, fri a friction that, that can, can be felt. And in that way, I'm not sure. Um, I think I think what, what works for me it's trying to see the essence of life, not 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 trying to get what I want, but just letting things be. Um, life is not about getting what you want, but accepting, uh, recognizing other beings, and if we can build these structures, these sanctuaries for other beings to express themselves in conjunction with our own expression. That's how we can collaborate together and, and move from a zero-sum game into an anti-zero-sum game where everyone wins. Uh, it is sort of making an ecoversity, basically. <laughs> Um, Kala, I'm not sure if you wanted to add something. We are at the end. Yeah, at the as as we in a completing, I also really appreciate in the chat the share around elements and the elemental 
um, relations. I look forward to checking that out more. Um, in particular, the acknowledgement that it that original peoples uh, in in all different places in the world have the those relationships with uh, elemental energies. Um, and I think there's uh, it's been a rich session. I think it's a lot uh, so much about listening and how we can continue to listen and interact and be part of the the living world also you know and that cleaning I, I appreciated that reference to um cleaning or clearing ourselves clear clean or clearing um our our fields and our awareness and um that's also really resonates for me with unlearning and you know some of the other values that we have core values that we have in the ecoversity uh shared values um that i feel we have so yeah, it's been, I hope that this session's been um, enjoyable and it's really a taster, right? Uh, there's so much more to dive into with different directions, but I've been happy to be here. And yeah, and and the spirit of breathing, breathing with that appreciation. I'm also touched with that. So thank you. Thank you all.